Dr. Bernstein, thank you very much for waiting. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Paul Bernstein. He's the Val A. Edith D. Green Presidential Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the Moran Eye Center here at the University of Utah. Uh, his basic and clinical science research interests have focused on uh, biochemistry and biophysics of inherited and acquired ocular disorders. His laboratory has been a consistent leader in the study of proteins involved in uptake, stabilization, and metabolism of very long chain polyunsaturated acids in the human uh, macula. And today he's going to tell us about uh, some exciting work that has sort of uh, combining the Utah large close knit families and a fluorescent lifetime imaging technique that uh, called FLEO that I believe he has developed. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen here. Sorry. That's at the very end of my talk. Sorry about that. Okay. Is, can everyone see my screen? Is this good? And hear me? Okay. I'm going to be talking today about a disease called macular telangiectasia type 2 or MACTEL. And I will be talking about our uh, success in figuring out its neurologic basis and it, or its uh, basis, its genetic basis and its uh, its alignment with uh, neurologic disease. Uh, I do want to make some disclosures that this work was funded by the Lowy Medical Research Institute, and uh, that I will be talking about a technique called fluorescence lifetime imaging or FLEO and uh, that this is still approved only for investigational use in the U.S. and Europe. In fact, we have the only device in the United States. And I just also wanna thank the organizers for asking me to talk here. I've learned a lot in the previous uh, talks today. So macular telangiectasia type two or MACTEL is an orphan disease. Uh, it's also known as idiopathic juxtaphobial telangiectasia. I can freely say that when I was a resident uh, 25 years ago or so, that this was a disease that we pretty much just ignored. It didn't have, it had moderate vision loss. It would occur typically in patients aged 40 to 60 years old. They would complain of some decreased vision, uh, especially when reading, but they didn't typically go blind. Uh, and we didn't have any treatments to um, offer to them and we had very poor imaging. So we were often missing this disease. And this, remained not only an orphan disease, but really I would say kind of a neglected disease and not really studied very much. But about 15 or 20 years ago, the, um, uh, a member of the, the richest family in Australia got this condition. And the family wanted to, were very frustrated that no one was studying this, no one was looking into this condition, even though it appeared to be moderately prevalent at a prevalence about one in 5,000. So every ophthalmologist has seen some of these patients. And they gathered together a, a, a group of luminaries and encouraged them and said, what would it take to get, uh, to get people to work on this disease? And they basically said, well, probably a hundred million dollars and a lot of effort and maybe we'll get something done. And they said, okay, go for it, we will fund that. So they put in a lot of, uh, they got a project going and it was learned as they started doing natural history studies that there were some characteristic imaging findings that we now could see, that there would be a loss of foveal carotenoid pigment, the macular pigment would redistribute into a ring, that there would be grain of the macula with abnormal blue light reflectance, and that there would be intraretinal crystals in the eye. And then especially, um, and then when we did fluorescein angiography, we could see that there would be temporal parafoveal telangiectatic vessels and late choroidal neovascularization. But it was also very important now that we had optical coherence tomography shown in the bottom right here, that we could see these very specific cavitations of the retina. 
these were not edema, but actually loss of tissue here that seemed to be associated with decrease um, with loss of Mueller cells, the glial cells in the retina. So um, they approached me early on in this project, not only because I knew something about the nutrition and carotenoid pigment in the eye, but also because uh, they were very interested in the project and trying to see if this could actually be an inherited retinal disorder and to see if we could figure out some genes that would be associated with this condition. And originally this disease was described by, uh, by Dr. Don Gass as an acquired kind of random disease. But as we started even looking at the first families that we had here, all I noticed that, and others had noticed that there were definitely multi-generational families that had been reported. And shown here on the right is just one that we had in my practice where using the Utah population database, we could see that we had two multi-generational families that did go back into you know, about six or so generations, but they were related. Uh, GWAS studies were done that detected three different loci, um, some of which were associated with the serine glycine metabolism and vascular caliber. So we had even more evidence that this would be likely be a genetic disease. But up until very recently, there were no causative genes that had been reported. And this was a big problem because most likely we had the, just like age-related macular degeneration, Alzheimer's disease, as we learned earlier today, multiple genes are gonna be involved. And then we're also complicated, just to, again, like Alzheimer's disease and many other neurologic diseases, that it's complicated by the fact that there's probably reduced penetrance and we also have very, we also have late onset. Patients don't typically develop this disease until they're 40 to 60 years old. So we set up uh, the Utah Center for MACTEL Genetics, and this was part of the research collaboration that was part of the MACTEL project. And our goal was to recruit large families with multiple affected members from the Intermountain West, construct super families, and calculate the genetic penetrance, and eventually use some of these families for gene discovery. And to figure out the, the genetic penetrance, we set up a project where we did, uh, with the patients that I identified from my practice, we did very comprehensive imaging and uh, con collected blood for blood draws. And we used, a, not only could I make the diagnosis, but we made sure that we had a, had a reading center that uh, in London that could do mass confirmation of the diagnosis. And then we also wanted to see with all of our programs, we wanted to look at all of their family members to see who might have this kind of subtle disease. And so we encouraged all family members to participate regardless of their ocular symptoms or history. And then uh, we, at least initially in this project, we excluded children under age 30 because we knew the prevalence was very low. And going through uh, eight years of enrollment, we identified 17 MACTEL probands we had at least one parent or sibling enrolled in the study as well, who came in for complete imaging. And we were very proud, we did a, we did a very good job of, the, of these 17 probands. We were able to get 73% or 52 out of 71 living siblings to come in for the, full, for the full study, and 11 out of 12 living parents, which is really, for this type of study is really, shows the value of the population here in the Intermountain West. And we found that there was no statistical difference in the age or sex of affected versus the unaffected individual. And we found in these families as we were going through them that there really were a, quite a few families that we had that had multi-generational and multiple people affected, very consistent with the genetic disease. This was the first family that we looked at showing three affected siblings and an affected parent. Another, several more families, again, with similar findings of siblings and parents affected. And uh, we had even using the Utah population database and putting together other families of people we thought, or probands we thought were unrelated. We could see that they were related in uh, at least many, several uh, four to five generations back. And of course we had other families where just one person was affected. And from this data, we could, uh, we could fairly definitively show that this really was a genetic disease with reduced penetrance. And so we calculated the genetic penetrance, which would range, it was a fully penetrant uh, disease. It would have a penetrance of 1.0 or 100% chance if you had a putative uh, disease to a very reduced penetrance, which would be much closer to zero. And we have to say we are calculating the apparent genetic penetrance because we, have multi we assume that multiple genes are involved. 
And from this analysis, we could see that this uh, penetrance of this disease was about 0.35 in the siblings and 0.55 among the parents. And from a blended penetrance, we could come up with a 0.38 penetrance. And from this, we could then, uh, the clinical implication of this is that we could say with confidence that this was a complex genetic trait, genetic disease, and that if an affected individual had the disease, there was about a 19% that the individual's parent, that any individual's parent or sibling would also have MACTEL. So we felt very confident going forward that we could continue trying to do more gene discovery, but we realized we'd be missing a lot, a number of patients who clinically did not, would have putative genes, but not necessarily show the disease either because they were too young or had other genetic, uh, other environmental or genetic factors that were reducing the penetrance. So, we next wanted to fill in the gaps and use, uh, use state-of-the-art imaging to try to figure out who uh, other people in the families who may be carrying MACTEL genes but are not showing this. And we took advantage of a new device that we were able to get from Germany called a fluorescence lifetime imaging ophthalmoscopy machine or a FLEO instrument. And it's a novel clinical instrument that, that does autofluorescence lifetime imaging of the retina. And instead of conventional fluorescence lifetime imaging or fluorescence imaging, which is shown here in this second line here, which we uh, routinely do in clinic where we uh, excite the fluorophores in the back of the eye and then uh, measure the intensity coming back uh, from based on the emission spectrum from the spectral dimension, we can get much more information in this patient who happens to have Stargardt disease we do use a pulsed laser instead rather than a continuous wave laser. And we can see that in this Stargardt patient, there's a lot of differences. These various white flecks that you have here turn out to have either short or long lifetimes shown here. Short is red, long, time, long lifetime is blue. And we can start to distinguish between fluorophores using this technology. And this is just showing in a normal uh, or a FLEO machine, or this is how it's showing up, but we have a short spectral channel and a long spectral channel. And these are normal images that show the macular pigment here. You can see the optic nerve and you can see the background from the lipofusin here. So these are the normal images that we have. But we could then, and we now know that some of these are coming from the retinal pigment epithelium, some of it's coming from elastic tissue and others are coming from the macular pigment. But we could apply this to a number of different conditions and see a whole variety of different patterns. We can see patterns associated with early macular degeneration. We can see lack of macular pigment in albinism. And we could see changes in the macular pigment in macular holes. And the, the very important thing we, saw, we noticed from the start is when we first imaged our MACTEL patients, we could see this very unusual pattern of a temporal crescent of blue long lifetime images here long lifetime patterns here that, was, that essentially was pathognomonic for the disease. We would see this in almost every patient that we would see. We don't exactly know what this is from, but we see this all the time. And we also noticed we could see this pattern even in some MACTEL family members too, that were clinically otherwise normal. So this temporal crescent or circular pattern, we could now temporal crescent or ring, we could now use to try to find other family members that would, that would potentially be having MACTEL. And we could then fill in the gaps and showing in one of our earlier families where we had two siblings, but we couldn't figure out which parent was affected. We could see that we would see much more of this pattern, this formation of this dark blue ring in the mother rather than the father. So we could see we would, when we would do genetic analysis, we would concentrate much more on the mother rather than the father's side. And we could even see some of this pattern in the siblings of the mother. So we felt confident we were, that this technique could be useful. We could also look at other families where we had true gaps, an uncle and a, and a nephew who both were affected. But the father, the, the, the intermediate person, seemed to be normal on every imaging that we had. But when we did fluorescence lifetime imaging, we could see formation of the ring and loss of the red macular pigment. And finally, we could then look at these at children of MACTEL patients and expand some of these families. And indeed, not only would we see the typical pattern here in MACTEL, 
but we could see it in a significant number of children of MACTEL patients. These were 20 and 30 year olds that, were, that looked completely normal otherwise. And from this, we could see that we could find even a similar pattern that out of 33 unaffected patients under age 40, we would see the definite pattern in about 36%. So we would predict that these, have, these pay, subjects have a high risk of developing MACTEL as they get older. And we saw it again in 100% of MACTEL patients and 0% of the healthy controls. So this information for MACTEL gave, allowed us to be confident that FLEO is a powerful new imaging tool to characterize MACTEL and that uh, we could develop, autom and we're working on developing automated uh, methods of analysis to make interpretation less subjective and it used this for some of our discovery of MACTEL genes. And that allows me to then come into the next part of my talk, which is uh, a, a summary of, what, of how we discovered the first causative genes for MACTEL. And uh, this work came out just one year ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. So when we were working on developing these families with MACTEL, one of them particularly struck me as being particularly interesting. And this was a patient who come in, came in unusually young. He was 21 years old and ha already had full-blown MACTEL. You can see the grain of the retina here. You can see the leakage here. You can see the ring of macular pigment. And not only was he young and affected, but it turned out that his father was also affected and had a plot um, shown here. So we had very similar findings. And we had a small family here. Now, what was it turned out in doing family history that these patients also had a neurologic syndrome that was thought to be Charcot Marie Tooth syndrome, but as we'll later learn, actually was something else. But it was very striking that in this very small segregation pattern, that there was this uh, rare neurologic disease that seemed to be segregating with the family. And we could even look at the, the proband's sisters, one of whom had the neurologic disease also. And so the proband is shown here, but his middle sister, who also had the neurologic disease, was starting to show this blue ring here, even though she was otherwise normal, while the oldest sister had no signs at all of MACTEL or of the, and did not have the neurologic disease. So we built out this family, or we collected this family and did, uh, did G, um, whole, exome sequencing on him, and it turned out that this family actually had something else. They had HSAN1, or hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy 1. Now, this is an extraordinarily rare disease. The prevalence is about one and a half a million, so many neurologists would not be very familiar with this disease. And it's a length-dependent axonal neuropathy. They have a lot of problems with pain and temperature, and it can be, it can be very debilitating. This uh, is known by, because, to be caused by several mutations in genes associated with the, the enzyme serine palmitoyl transferase. And our family had the C133Y mutation in SPTLC1. So this is a rare enough disease that we didn't have any other families in Utah that we were aware of, but there was a known and well-published family in Pennsylvania with this condition, and the pedigree is shown here. And we contacted uh, the neurologist who was working on this family and asked, well, have you looked to see if they have any eye disease? And he said, we never looked. Uh, but we then first checked our database and it turned out that actually some of his patients were already enrolled in our study. So they clearly did have some of the eye disease. And as we started flying these patients out and examining them, it turned out that essentially every patient over age 40 with this HSAN1, uh, who had the same mutation as our family here, also had macular telangiectasia type 2, and definitely had the changes that we were seeing in the fluorescence lifetime imaging. So this turned out to be very consistent, even though it's a rare disease. We found several other families, all of which had the same mutation here, the C133Y mutation. And then, to, but we were, of course, were worried that there might be other genes that might be just uh, in linkage with this, but it turned out there was another family in Australia that we found that had both the neurologic disease and the, uh, and the eye phenotype that had a mutation in the other subunit of the, of the, gene, of the enzyme, SPTLC2. 
SPTLC2. So we felt very confident that this actually, that mutations in this, uh, affecting this enzyme were associated with the disease. And that's just shown here. So and in the end, 13 out of 14 HSAN patients that we examined have, you, have MACTEL or the MACTEL FLEO pattern. And the one that we haven't, who uh, failed on this, did not have clinical back, uh, HSAN1 uh, and did not, or had HSAN1, but no clinical MACTEL, but we, he was not able to come out to Utah, so we could not, but we would predict he probably had the FLEO pattern. So what does this enzyme do and what kind of insights can we get into both into neurodegeneration and into uh, eye disease? Well, uh, SPT or uh, serine palmitoyl transferase is involved in making ceramides. It normally makes ceramides that go on to sphingosine and sphingomyelin. If you have a mutation in this, uh, in, this disease, in this gene, it doesn't make the enzyme not work. It actually just changes its substrate specificity. So it now takes alanine and then makes that into de toxic deoxyceramides and deoxysphingomyelins. And that's shown here. And with this mutation, these toxic, these toxic uh, molecules are probably causing both the neuropathy and the eye disease. And we've confirmed since then that serine levels are low and that deoxysphingolipids are elevated in generally in MACTEL patients. So even though they don't have this mutation, particular mutation, other genes that are uh, in the serine pathways are probably causing similar uh, abnormalities, and that's shown here that we see in the HSAN1 patients. And we've then looked at mouse models and, uh, and created conditions where the, by dietary changes so that serine is low. And again, they develop these elevated levels of these toxic deoxysphingolipids, and they have retinal dysfunction by electroretinograms. And we've also been able to look at this in retinal organoids and see that these deoxysphingolipids are, uh, can, can cause problems. And that if you use enzyme, uh, use drugs that disrupt the pathway and, uh, and do not generate so many of these deoxysphingolipids, you can decrease the photoreceptor toxicity. So the conclusions are that uh, using this large worldwide consortium to study this very rare and uh, or this rare and misunderstood disease, we have identified the first genes that cause MACTEL. We know that SPTLC1 and 2 are highly penetrant, but certainly not the only genes for MACTEL, but it gives us important uh, insights on the mechanisms causing this disease and uh, gives us insights on how we might treat this disorder. Because already if for HSAN1, there are clinical trials that have been positive showing that high doses of serine, about 30 grams per day, can help uh, decrease the amount of these deoxysphingolipids and decrease the neuropathy. And we're gearing up to do some of these studies in MACTEL patients. And so this, and we've certainly found a reason because this common pathway of serine and sphingolipid metabolism can explain the genetic complexity of MACTEL and suggest both the possibility of both personalized and uh, universal treatments uh, to treat this disorder. So the take home messages that we have uh, for neuro people studying neurodegeneration is that we now know that MACTEL shows, shares a common pathogenesis in genetics with a rare neurologic condition uh, called HSAN1. And we've learned now that we need to question a lot of our MACTEL patients about neuropathy. And indeed, many of them do have significant neuropathies that show that they may be having problems. And neurologists likewise need to be cognizant of the potential retinal maculopathies that they may be having in their patients. And so we uh, hope that we can con continue to have good uh, collaborations to try to uh, solve these interesting eye and neurologic disorders. And of course, this was a very large uh, project that was uh, funded through the MACTEL project through the Lowy Medical Research Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for that wonderful presentation. It was exciting and provocative. And I know you mentioned that serine supplementation was a treatment, but could you comment on the use of nutrition or nutrient supplements at all? 
Sure. So for the, in regard to this, uh, serine supplements are available uh, on the market. They're about, but they're given at 30 grams per day. So it's a pretty high dose. Fortunately, it's a fairly, it's a, a mildly sweet compound and does well. As an eye disease specialist, we do, we, I've been studying nutrition for many, many years here, biochemical basis and treatment for eye disease. We know that uh, lutein and zeaxanthin that are found in dark green leafy vegetables are protective against age-related macular degeneration and are concentrated in the macula. I showed that in some of the FLEO pictures earlier in the talk. And it does seem to be important in MACTEL, at least in, we're trying to understand the pathogenesis, why the macular pigment either drops out or redistributes in these patients. We've tried clinical studies of supplementation of lutein and zeaxanthin in MACTEL patients, and it doesn't seem to do a whole lot for them. It just makes the ring more intense. But in other eye diseases, we definitely recommend it. And also in my research work, we've been studying omega-3 fatty acids, but the retina has a lot of interesting, unusual omega-3 fatty acids, the very long chain fatty acids, which, uh, which I'm studying also in my research laboratory. Great. Uh, we have a, another question from Stefan Pulst. Um, he asks, could SPTLC1 and 2 be risk genes for ALS? Did they come up in the GWAS? Dominant alleles cause juvenile ALS. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. We, in the, I have not, I, we have been very attentive to seeing if we have neurologic um, other neurologic diseases in these MACTEL patients. I've seen early onset Parkinson's disease. I have not seen any, I've not seen ALS in any of our MACTEL patients, but we would be happy to look at some of these patients if that, if SPTLC, SPTLC mutations are associated. So I th on the GWAS studies itself, SPTLC mutations are so rare that it did not come up in the GWAS, but we, what we did find in the GWAS and what will be coming out as the next genes for MACTEL are some of the genes that are involved in serine synthesis, PHGDH. So they have to, it has to be just the right kind of sweet spot of a common enough gene that has enough of an effect. So it's, uh, but it's, it's a very interesting process to try to identify genes in these complex diseases. Thank you so much, Paul. I hope you'll understand that we need to move on because we're a little short on time, but I know people know where to reach you. We see it right here, so we can uh, continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, so our next sp speaker is Dr. Donna Cross. She's Associate Professor and Director of Neuroimaging and Biotechnology Lab at the Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences at the University of Utah. Oops, <laughs> hold on a second. <laughs> Uh, her work applies uh, different types of imaging and uh, data analytic approaches in order to make a significant impact on therapeutic and diagnostic options. And she's going to present a slight, a different range of disorders for us to think about. Go ahead, Donna. Hey, thank you, Debbie. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, so I want to thank the organizers and the Neuroscience Initiative for inviting me to speak today. And I'll be talking about some um, imaging for research of brain injury and neurodegeneration. Wait a sec. Okay. I don't know why. This is not advancing. Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, so you know, in recent, in the past decade, there's been a lot of interest in the idea that repetitive mild brain injury uh, can lead to eventual neurodegenerative disorders. And when we look at the brains um, pathologically that have uh, experienced uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the main neurodegenerative disorder associated with head trauma, we see widespread um, reactive gliosis as well as accumulation of tau protein uh, in the depths of the sulci as well as around the major vasculature of the brain. So we can see on this schematic that the effects of an impact on the skull of the brain um, 
are several different, uh, several multi-layered, so to speak. We see a vascular injury. We see compression of the dural and subdural spaces. We see disruption of the blood-brain barrier, including the astrocytes and aggregation and proliferation of microglia. And eventually we also see um, axonal and neuronal injury as indicated down in the brain parenchyma. So with that in mind, when we're thinking about how do we image acute TBI, uh, primarily that is um, considered to be um, contrast enhanced CT, but also some MRI in some cases. And the features that we see primarily are things like hematoma, contusion, edema, um, but a primary uh, 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 sign of mild injury would be this diffuse axonal injury, which it turns out is rather difficult to appreciate on standard acute TBI imaging modalities. So when we're talking about, oops, when we're talking about um, diffuse axonal injury, it's a white matter shearing injury that's caused by the mechanical impact. It's most commonly found in areas of differing tissue, tissue density, such as between white matter and gray matter borders. Um, longer axonal fibers are more susceptible to the injury, and there's a disruption of important processes such as axonal transport. Um, and this is thought to be one of the main drivers of the link to uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. So if we look a little bit more closely at the proteins that uh, make up the cytoskeleton, um, the primary one would be microtubules, which have a dynamic stability that is affected by and, and stabilized by tau protein. But when you have an injured or defective microtubule and a degenerating axon, the tau protein becomes disassociated from the microtubule and is then sequestered into nerve fibrillary tangles in the brain. One of the challenges to um, imaging diffuse axonal injury is indeed the small size of these proteins that, that are involved in the cytoskeleton, as you can appreciate with these high resolution images. So um, a modality that what has been developed um, amongst others to image white matter integrity within the brain is known as diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, this imaging modality um, takes advantage of our ability to assess the movement of water molecules within tissue. And we can, um, using diffusion ten tensor imaging, uh, not only assess the aggregate amount of movement of the water molecules, but also their direction. With that, we can do fiber tracking, and we're able to nicely delineate um, the white matter areas of the brain and the white matter tracks. Now, this imaging modality is not without its limitations, particularly in areas of high degree of crossing fibers, as well as in areas that are adjacent to air and bone spaces. Um, however, it does uh, it's probably the most common method by which we can assess uh, white matter injury after head injury, head impacts. And just to show that um, we can use DTI in combination with other modalities, this was a study that we did a number of years ago in which we performed diffusion tensor imaging um, in a group of aging individuals we then looked at a parameter known as fractional anisotropy in the olfactory tract of these individuals. And with, the, with that number, the FA number of these individuals, we correlated it over the entire FDG PET scan. So an FDG PET scan, again, is looking at generalized metabolism in the brain. It's the metabolism of glucose. But we took a white matter parameter and we looked at what happens in the brain if that uh, if we have a loss of integrity of that white matter track. And we showed nicely in this, uh, in this result that this, is, this top row is an image of a z-score map of the, the correlation value of the FDG PET scan. And we can see that there is a, a metabolic reduction in the regions that are um, that are associated with olfactory tract uh, connections. So in this schematic, we can see the olfactory tract 
and its associated connections drawn in here. And there's a nice correspondence to what we see hypometabolically on these brains as they're aging. And what this really kind of more importantly indicates is that when white matter starts to degrade in the brain, we lose metabolic function. And so we can kind of start to begin to see how axonal injury in head trauma can be associated with other um, later problems that may begin to signal neurodegeneration. So it's important when we're trying to understand how head trauma can be associated with later life neurodegeneration to look at individuals who have experienced head trauma but are in a more chronic phase. So we're not looking at acute head trauma. In this case, we're imaging individuals who have experienced repeated mild trauma um, but are further along or later in, in a chronic phase of the injury. So for this, I'm going to use as an example some research that we started in 2008 um, back in Seattle at the University of Washington with um, researchers at the Puget Sound VA. Um, and with, with this study, uh, we were looking at um, veterans who had returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. They were three to five years out from their last blast. They had experienced between five and 100, over 100 uh, mild blast exposures. And um, they were experiencing some very mild but persistent cognitive symptoms. And so um, the researchers at the Puget Sound VA came to us at, um, at University of Washington Radiology and they said, you know, we want to see if there's anything really wrong with these guys um, in their brains. Because at that point, uh, there wasn't a lot of knowledge about head injuries from repeat mild trauma. And in fact, many clinicians thought that um, these were mainly psychological problems and related to PTSD. So there was a lot of skepticism that we would even find anything um, wrong with the brains on brain scans. So for the first 12 subjects that basically walked in the door, we did um, FTG PET scanning and we did the 3D SSP analysis that Dr. Cheska described in his talk, where we're looking at an individual compared to a normal database. Um, and then we, we looked and we averaged all of those individual scans together and we found that collectively as a group, um, these 12 individuals showed hypometabolic uh, regions primarily in the cerebellum. So that was just the first 12 guys that walked in the door and we published this, I think, back in 2011. For the next study, we then looked at the white matter abnormalities. First, the top row shows the uh, fractional anisotropy, the, the diffusion tensor imaging results over our group. And I think at this point we were up to 23 subjects. And we showed you know, a primary um, foci in the corpus callosum, a few other scattered areas. Um, however, when we used a different MRI uh, imaging modality, macromolecular proton fraction imaging, which is primarily an evaluator of myelin degradation, we saw much more extensive white matter abnormalities associated with myelin, which was very interesting. So DTI, FA, is not specific to any particular white matter abnormality, and it could be a collection of several different issues, but MPF is thought to be particular to myelin. And then for um, the final study uh, from this group uh, back in 2014, we looked at um, the the log number of blasts that these uh, subjects had experienced. And I think at this point we were up to 40 subjects and with more blast exposure correlated to these individuals back to the PET scans again, we were seeing this persistent um, hypometabolic region in the inferior frontal and cerebellar areas associated with more blast exposure. Um, so this research is still ongoing, and in fact, we're still publishing data, but these were the most relevant findings from, um, from these studies. However, um, one of the more important aspects of this research, which you can appreciate if we're trying to understand how many mild head injuries will lead to an eventual neurodegeneration, is to say, okay, if we do multiple scans in these individuals, 
we do longitudinal scanning, um, how is the brain changing over time? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it staying the same? Um, we would like to know how to evaluate this. And it turns out that in the context of head injury is very complicated. We can do that in issues of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease because many or most of the individuals experiencing that disease have a common pattern on um, imaging that we can detect. But with head injury, you can appreciate on this figure right here, these are 10 different individuals who had longitudinal scans. This is the first scan of each of these individuals. And you can appreciate this is just an individual compared to a normal database that each one has a different pattern of metabolic deficits. So this is FTG PET again. And you know we see this individual here who has a very high uh, hypometabolism in the medial frontal lobe. You see this individual who is more superior medial um, regions that are metabolic, hypometabolic, et cetera. So the heterogeneity in the initial presentation makes this analysis challenging. And also, um, there's heterogeneity in their changes over time. This may be due to reorganization. It may be due to differences in the initial injury and, and how they experience therapy. Um, and then this particular challenge really limits our ability to produce meaningful results in group-wise analyses. So we have to um, kind of approach this in a more precision me medicine individualized manner, which is difficult when it comes to brain imaging. So our first pass at this, we did um, a more crude analysis, and this is just an example from one subject. But what we did in this analysis is we segmented the brain into 26 regions of interest, volumes of interest. And we um, then counted simply the number of pixels above a certain threshold that were considered hypermetabolic. And we looked at how many of these regions are having more hypermetabolic pixels and how many are having less. So how many are declining and how many are increasing. And then we considered that evidence of recovery or decline. And then we also looked as it overall measure of all the hypermetabolic pixels in the brain. And in this particular subject, you may be tempted to say, well, this really intense hypermetabolic area in the medial frontal lobe has improved um, by, its sec by his second scan. But in fact, we found that the hypermetabolic regions had just kind of distributed throughout the entire brain. And in fact, it was, there were more hypermetabolic pixels by the second scan. So we consider that this subject is actually uh, declining and not in, or worsening over time. Here are two more examples from the same cohort uh, where we have the top scan, scan one and scan two from an individual who actually showed more uh, regions of interest that improved than then declined and actually saw, had less hypometabolic pixels in their second scan. So we considered that this um, individual had improved, whereas the second individual, these bottom two rows, first scan, second scan, actually had more regions declining than improving and an increase in the hypometabolic pixels. So we consider this subject to be uh, declining. And in fact, we're now, um, we're, we have efforts to kind of correspond these results in these individuals to their neurocognitive assessments so we can better understand how we may alter individual therapies to kind of and tailor them to the individual um, with re respect to their brain imaging findings. So um, another example that I'd like to uh, discuss today is from our research in which we're trying to develop um, therapeutics using preclinical uh, TBI models, as in mice. So this was a study we published just last year, and we um, developed a model in mice that we thought was um, fairly relevant to mild uh, repeated impacts, which was uh, with no cr craniotomy, we gave five mild impacts to uh, the head of the mouse over five days. And for this therapeutic, we're looking at um, the microtubule stabilizer paclitaxel, which is commonly used in cancer. 
And since it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, we're administering a very small dose and it's through intranasal administration, otherwise through the nose. Uh, this specifically targets the brain. Um, so in this study, we found that mice that had experienced um, the five impacts in five days, uh, head trauma had a significant reduction in whole brain glucose metabolism. This corresponded to a reduction in the CA1, the synapse, synapses as evaluated by PSD95 stain in the CA1 hippocampus. And as well, these mice on the radio water tread maze had significantly uh, decreased uh, memory of the maze. Um, and then mice who got a single dose of the drug after the first impact, so day one, they get the impact, they get a single intra intranasal dose of the drug, um, all of these uh, outcomes were improved and in fact, not any different from our sham controls. So improved glucose metabolism, uh, preservation of synapses, and um, preservation of memory from our maze test. When we look at the uh, MRI from these same mice, we found that using T1 weighted and T2 mapping, we were able to see that um, apparently right under the area of impact, there was what appeared to be a small microbleed. And we saw this in every single animal uh, that was hit. However, the animals that got the paclitaxel, we did not see this apparent microbleed. Now, unfortunately, um, by the 30 days uh, post-imaging uh, time point, we didn't see evidence of this microbleed anymore, so we weren't able to confirm that finding with histology. Um, however, uh, we will in the next the next round we will we will do that. But it, it does appear that we um, that the drug somehow uh, managed to um, mitigate the vascular damage from this uh, five hits in five days. Uh, impact model. And then finally, we used diffusion uh, tensor imaging with track based spatial statistics analysis to evaluate the white matter damage in the brains after in injury, which we can see here in the blue color, um, where the brighter blue indicates more white matter injury. And then we confirmed using silver stain that when we gave the drug, that the uh, paclitaxel prevented that axonal injury in these areas with white matter damage that we uh, were able to see with DTI. So as a final part of my talk, I'd just like to go over the uh, molecular imaging efforts um, for chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. Um, CTE is most commonly seen in athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive head impacts. It's a progressive degeneration of brain tissue, which includes the buildup of tau protein, as I said, as well as um, gliosis. And um, this degeneration is associated with memory loss, confusion, impaired judgment, impulse control problems, and aggression, which can be particularly problematic um, in elderly male patients who are the primary demographic for CTE. Um, symptoms often begin years or even decades after the last head trauma, and currently CTE is only diagnosed after death. So there's a considerable amount of clinical and research interest for imaging biomarkers of CTE, and these are ongoing, as I'll show you. Um, as I mentioned, we do see an accumulation of tau tracers. These are just a few that, are, that have been developed. There are more underway, both as you've heard from previous speakers, the first generation and the second generation uh, tau tracers. And so this is a, a study from a few years ago um, of a single 39-year-old uh, retired NFL player with probable CTE. Um, the uh, Tracer was fluorotalcipir AB1451, which um, Dr. Cheska presented uh, quite a bit about. And the findings in this study were um, that there was tracer uptake in areas consistent with areas that tau accumulation has been seen in autopsy brains with CTE. That being said, a limitation of the study was that they did not have autopsy confirmation of the findings. And so, um, you know, it, it's hard to really say 
how well the tracer has uh, performed in this instance. Uh, this subject also had amyloid imaging, which you can see on the left side, which was negative for this, for this subject. This was a more recent study just published this year, also using fluortazepir as well as um, some other imaging modalities to evaluate uh, a former US football player uh, with confirmed CTE because they were able to perform an autopsy on this subject. Unfortunately, um, this report said that although the uh, fluortazepir binding generally agreed with the postmortem tau, um, it was only a modest correlation and there was a very low signal. And they attributed this less than exciting finding to the four years interval um, between the tracer, uh, between the scan and the autopsy. But in addition to that, they also indicated the possibility that um, all of the tau tracers currently under development and in use were developed for AD and were confirmed by autopsy cases in AD and not for CTE, and that there may be some differences in the tertiary structures between the two neurodegenerative diseases that may affect the binding. So it really kind of underscores the need for a better tracer development that's specific to CTE um, to you know, further this particular imaging agent. Now, I do want to bring up um, the consideration that tau may not be the best diagnostic tracer um, for CTE because it's likely that tau accumulation in the case of CTE is much later. So if they want to use an imaging modality as an, uh, an indicator to stop playing because your brain is becoming damaged from multiple impacts, um, it could be that you know a, a, a tau um, tracer would be a more later phase of the disease and, and maybe we need to develop other imaging agents and biomarkers of um, head trauma that would be more indicative of, of that. So going back to my slide from the beginning, where we're looking at other features of traumatic brain injury, again, we saw vascular changes and we saw um, inflammatory changes with regard to microglia and astrocytes. So one area of uh, considerable interest in the development of brain radio tracers is, are those for neuroinflammation. And as we can see, there are many injuries and in brain diseases that result in um, upregulation of neuroinflammation in the brain, of which traumatic brain injury is just one of a, a rather long list. Um, in this case, this is a study, again, of a probable uh, CTE in NFL play players in which they used um, carbon-11 DP DPA, which is a uh, TSBO tracer. TSBO is translocator pro protein, which is located on the outer mitochondrial membrane um, and is upregulated in the cases of neuroinflammation. Um, I, in this particular study, they did find increased tracer uptake in the C probable CTE cases. Again, this was not autopsy confirmed. Um, however, a limitation is that uh, TSBO is not specific to either microglia nor astrocytes nor any particular um, neuroinflammatory process of which there are different phases and different um, uh, different uh, processes that are involved in different stages of neuroinflammatory uh, events. So there's a lot of research interest to develop more specific tracers for neuroinflammation. This is just a not comprehensive, but um, just kind of a survey of some of the efforts underway. Um, but again, I, I draw into question the lack of specificity as an evaluator, as a biomarker of CTE or of the uh, conversion from head trauma to neurodegenerative type processes in the brain. So as a final part of my talk, I'd just like to go over some of the targets that I personally think might be valuable in traumatic brain injury research, um, such as targets to evaluate chronic TBI, we've already discussed uh, tau deposition and chronic gliosis, but what about synaptic loss? We um, have the SV2A uh, synaptic tracers, um, which 
uh, could be valuable to, to see uh, if we're actually getting synaptic loss in the brain at an early stage of um, repeated head trauma. There are also MRI modalities uh, to look at things like iron dep deposition, which are a result of uh, microbleeds, and things as I showed earlier, um, such as myelin loss or atrophy. We are also can look at tracers and targets that may be more applicable to a um, more chronic phase or to acute uh, phase of the disease in which we might use them to evaluate when is a brain becoming injured and when should people stop play or return to play. Um, and those are more subtle changes in the brain that may not be, that may correct after an initial uh, mild head trauma, but you know, eventually after repeated head trauma, we start to see persistent um, changes that do not uh, improve. Those would be things like um, blood-brain barrier permeability. Um, we know that initially it becomes leaky and permeable with a head injury, but eventually returns to normal. But that it, is that true um, after repeated head injuries over time? Uh, how about perfusion, brain perfusion? And how about, more importantly, neurovascular coupling? So we saw that there was injury, not only to the blood-brain barrier, but also to the vasculature around the brain. And ha what happens if this coupling mechanism, mechanism if um, the CVR does not return to normal? Is this indicative of things like persistent symptoms and a persistent brain injury that may eventually um, turn into neurodegeneration? And again, we would like to have improved methods to investigate diffuse axonal injury and to kind of evaluate um, those changes over time. One of the biggest challenges to this research is that our animal models to investigate uh, TBI, such as rodents, uh, do not produce key pathological features, um, such as tau deposition, by which CTE is currently defined. They have smooth brains, and there are differences in head and neck anatomy. So with that, um, I'm finishing up my talk, and this is just um, a list of the people I would like to thank in my lab, Dr. Minishima, Dr. Anzai, um, our students, and our collaborators, both at the University of Utah and at the VA Puget Sound, Elaine Peskin and David Cook. And thank you, if there's any questions. Okay, thank you, Donna. That was a very exciting and stimulating presentation. And um, really complemented well the discussions we had on other forms of uh, neurodegeneration. I think uh, we do have a, a question here from Norm Foster. You sort of addressed a little bit. You, you touched on it in your challenges in your slot last slide. Do we know how the tau in CTE differs from that in AD? For example, the extent or location of phosphorylation or electomicroscopy. So. I wish I could answer that in a really um, <laughs> scientific manner. Uh, I, d I do know there are differences, as I said, in like the tertiary structures, and there's definitely differences in the location. So as we saw in Alex's talk, um, tau accumulating initially in the hippocampus, in, in the uh, entorenal cortex, and then spreading uh, throughout the brain, Whereas in CTE, we see it primarily, like I said, in the depths of the sulci and around the cortical, uh, the major cortical blood vessels, which is thought to represent actually the mechanical um, shearing in the brain. The tau is accumulating in areas where the shear is the greatest. As I said, the shearing happens to be in the differences in tissue types, which it happens between uh, the brain tissue and the vascular tissue or in the depths of the sulci where you're gonna get a lot of mechanical stress. Um, so, that, so the tau is accumulating differently in those diseases and likely of different origins. And yes, the, the general structure is the same, but finer structures um, appear to be different. Okay, great. Uh, what about the pretreatment with paclitex paclitexel that you discussed for uh, preventing microbleeds? You have presented that in a mouse model, is that right? Yes. And has that been taken forward to conceptualize that in a human, uh, like so, <laughs> arena? I'm, I'm actually working on it. So I'm okay. collaborating right now with Henry Kopchak in the um, Department of uh, Pharmacology and Jane Yang. And we, he has some really great modifications of 
uh, paclitaxel that um, are, have been modified for better tissue persistence and believe it or not, brain uptake. So that's really exciting. We've done all the preliminary studies over the last year and the results are amazing, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we just submitted, um, I think two weeks ago, an STTR grant with Theratarget um, and uh, Matt Peterson uh, to develop the idea and to take it into a human clinical trial. Um, we've expanded on that early research to now um, administering the drugs after the total injury. So we're trying to look at how far out we can apply the drugs and still see the same improvement in the response. And it's really super exciting, but again, I can't talk about it in detail. <laughs> Well, that's great. Um, we are running very late, so I'm going to now pass this over to Dr. Satoshi Minishima, who will provide us with a summary and uh, some cogent statements, I'm sure. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Debbie. Um, so I'm going to just use a few slides to uh, close this really exciting symposium um, on so neural degeneration, I think, in the last uh, 20, 30 years. I think we have a much greater insight into how any uh, genetic causes actually affecting neurons and creating. And Dr. Minoshima, your, your audio is not working. Oh, you're not working? Uh, it's very, um, very scratchy sounding. Are you using a microphone? I'm using a microphone, yes. Okay, yeah, it's, it's very staticky. Is that right? Mm. Okay. That is interesting. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. It's just it's just very scatticky, unfortunately. Okay. Let me actually just do one thing. Um, is this better? Yes, very well. well thank you. Um, <clears throat> So I think insights into a new neural degeneration, I think it's really advanced in the last 20 to 30 years and uh, neurons are dying, but it's not just simply neurons are dying. There is an astrocyte immune reaction, BBB issues I think we discussed today and the molecules and everything involved. So I think uh, really understanding how neural degeneration occurs, uh, we have to have a holistic kind of approach to better understand not just neurons, but uh, molecules to uh, surrounding uh, structures, supporting structures as well. And uh, uh, from a therapeutic viewpoint and imaging viewpoint, I think still uh, protein aggregation is uh, actually one of the major focus. And I just today learned the oxysphingal uh, lipids um, um, in the MACTEL condition. So material deposition causing uh, neuronal deaths and uh, cell deaths in the eyes. I think uh, uh, can potentially be a major, major target for uh, therapeutic development. And uh, uh, through the four uh, lectures today, I made this summary yesterday. So there is a huge gen genetic component and the better understanding of molecules involved and the physiology and the pathophysiology. I think this actually gives us a lot of uh, interesting uh, ideas for therapeutic uh, development, uh, just like Ryan, mechanistic approach to the disease, and uh, biomarkers and imaging, and the imaging itself actually giving uh, uh, lots of pathophysiological information, both in the brain imaging and eye imaging, but also using a biomarker for uh, clinical trials, such as using a PET for uh, amyloid uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, treatment. And I think on top of this is really uh, based on those information, how we're going to actually develop more uh, effective therapies. So I just wanted to present this slide that this neurodegeneration research now is a very holistic kind of a field. Uh, people working in this field probably understand all of those multi kind of a domain approach, but then focus uh, on uh, one of those domains for advanced science. So it's really, really exciting field. So with that, um, I really like to, uh, uh, Debbie and I, uh, um, would like to uh, uh, thank all the presenters today. So Dr. Czetska uh, from uh, Germany, I think he's still on the call. And uh, Ryan Watts uh, from uh, San Francisco and the Paul uh, Bernstein from uh, Utah and Dr. Dana Cross from Utah. So it's a multi-regional uh, and a multi-organ 
and uh, multi-level uh, neuroscience research presentation. So this was really exciting. So thank you so much for all the presenters and also people actually stayed uh, on the symposium. Uh, despite a small uh, delay, uh, only 35 minutes, 40 minutes uh, extension, but it's such a refreshing symposium in the era of COVID. So thank you so much for this great symposium.